My name is Mazlan Othman, and I'm here to talk about a new space era that's developing in the world today, and how to position Malaysia in this new reality. When we talk about space, we think about the United States, uh, Russia, China, India, big governments. When we talk about a space organization, we all think about NASA, another huge organization. And when we talk about the space industry, we talk about Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Ball Aerospace, big companies. But the reality today is quite different, and it is called new space. And new space is a term that describes a movement and philosophy of a group of companies that are privately funded and whose main focus is on lowering costs through using commercial off-the-shelf technologies and as well as services and products, and of course, innovation. But what is really exciting about this new space movement is the focus on establishing a human space presence. I'm sure you find, you see all these guys who are very familiar to you. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon.com, who also founded Blue Origin, that is developing rockets that will take people like you and me to outer space. Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic, who is building aeroplanes to take people to outer space. And two days ago, Richard Branson announced that he would also be wanting to build hotels for his space tourists. Now, in this sense, he is a little bit behind Robert Bigelow, who already has a space hotel which has been installed and tested on the International Space Station today. But the guy who is really exciting everyone and creating a buzz, not only, amongst the, in, not only in the space community, but amongst the people in general, is Elon Musk, the guy who brought you um, Tesla, the electric car. He also set up SpaceX. Now, for your information, we, um, space, uh, SpaceX rockets brought Malaysia's satellite Razatsat to the near equatorial orbit, making it the first remote sensing satellite in the world to go to that orbit. So what about Elon Musk? He, has, he announced a plan two weeks ago for an interplanetary transport system that would make us an interplanetary species. He wants to take people, uh, humans, to Mars by 2024, and he reckons that within 40 to 100 years of the first human beings landing on Mars, there will be about a million pe uh, people forming a colony on Mars. NASA too has declared that it will have people on Mars by the year 2035, so you can see how NASA is 10 years behind uh, SpaceX, and India has gone to Mars, and in, in the United Arab Emirates, for instance, is going to um, launch a Martian orbiter by the year 2021. So why is all this interest in Mars? Now, we have discovered water on Mars, and we have evidences that show that there was liquid water on Mars a uh, few million years ago. What this means is that the possibility of finding a life on Mars is very, very high. But I personally um, don't have to have life as uh, uh, something to motivate me, even though I'm supposed to be the alien ambassador for, for aliens. I'm supposed to be the UN uh, ambassador for aliens. I would like to go there to see Olympus Mons soaring 25 kilometers into the Martian sky. Compare this with Everest, which is only about nine kilometers. At its base, the diameter of Olympus Mons is about 600 kilometers, remembering that the distance between Penang and Singapore is 700 kilometers. I would also like to see the Grand Canyon of Mars four meters deeper than the Grand Canyon in the US and, tens, and many tens of times wider than the Grand Canyon. And if you place the Grand Canyon of Mars on Earth, it will stretch across the whole of the United States from one coast to another. Now, wouldn't it be cool to be a space tourist on Mars? Well, I think so. Coming back to Earth then, 
this new space era has uh, resulted in a blossoming of entrepreneurs. Some are, uh, some are old, but most of them are very young, like these three American guys who are building small satellites um, in, in you know, not a very fancy lab. And they're going to launch these small satellites, hundreds of these small satellites into space to provide service to all of man, uh, humankind. And there are others. There are Indians, Japanese, and even a few Malaysians in the pipeline. And look at this guy, this New Zealand guy who, lit, who built his uh, rocket literally in his backyard. But there's also something very exciting coming out of the new space era, which is the new age of exploitation. Luna Mission One is an example of a non-governmental organization that uh, raised money through, uh, getting, um, through, public, through going to the internet and getting money from the public called crowdfunding. And the whole idea there is to try and um, mine on the moon. Well, you might think this is just idle dream of a non-governmental organization, but in November of last year, the United States Congress Senate voted to pass this, to legalize space mining. Lots of countries in the world are unhappy about this, but this, as far as the United States is concerned, is legal. And uh, it's been estimated that such a business would come up to a few trillion dollars in the future. So this is um, not idle, uh, not insignificant. Also, the new, new space has, through its uh, low-cost uh, approaches, has allowed the emergence of developing countries. Countries like Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, South Africa, Kenya, Venezuela, uh, Chile, and in our region, Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore. So where does this leave Malaysia? We are not going to start from scratch. We have the National Planetarium, which, is the, which sets the foundation for education in our country. We have the National Observatory, which is doing a lot of space science, including astronomy and space weather. We have manufacturing facilities that allow us to build satellites that are of international standard. And we have built our own satellites. This is Tiongsat, which, which was launched in the year 2000. And this is Razatsat in the year 2008. And you can see that our emphasis has always been on human capital. We have been using space for very important applications, such as uh, air pollution monitoring, deforestation, um, looking out for forest fires, and many others. So we are not new to the field of space, especially the fact that we have launched an astronaut, as was uh, informed in the very beginning. And this is Sheikh Buzafa, who was the first uh, Malaysian to go into space, and we are hoping that uh, many more will come. So how are we going to position Malaysia in this new space era? First of all, we've got to solidify our education base. Uh, you saw uh, the number of people we train for each program uh, that we have. We should also focus on the science. I was talking about astronomy and uh, space weather, but this could go on to other space sciences, uh, for instance, microgravity science, which many universities are taking part in. And importantly, we have to develop some new technologies. This is important because unless we have some new technologies, the other, mem the other countries are not going to look to us uh, for partnership. The, all of these things will make an indust a space industry happen in Malaysia. And this space industry will not only uh, work to improve all of those uh, education, science and technology, but it will make space a sustainable enterprise in Malaysia. But none of that will happen if we don't have a good governance ecosystem, meaning that we must start ratifying the international space treaties, we must also set up policies, regulations and guidelines that will make space enterprise uh, successful. But remember, when I began uh, talking, 
I was saying about what inspired all of, uh, new, all of the world and why new spaces come into being is because we want to establish a human presence in space. This is going to be one of the biggest adventures of humankind since the days of Christopher Columbus. So we are almost ready to be there to join the rest of the world. So we can, shouldn't be left behind. Now to end my talk, I'd like to uh, quote John F. Kennedy, who inspired America's move to the moon. And he said that we go to the moon not because it is easy, we go to the moon because it is hard. But more importantly, what the moonshot, what the American moonshot teaches us is that a huge ambition will force us into rally, rallying and coordinating our resources, particularly human resource or human capital as we call it. And I think it's extremely important that going forward, it's the young people who are going to lead Malaysia. And a lot of that talent is in this room today, vested in the young people here, namely you. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs>